episode 152 of Australia's number one marketing show. In this episode, I have an inspiring fireside chat with an entrepreneur who has strong opinions about business courage, the power of partnerships, and why office location is critical to business success. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to take your marketing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Tim Reid. G'day, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Australia's number one marketing show. I am your host, Timbo Reid, but you, you, so much more importantly, are a motivated small business owner ready to crank out some great marketing in order to build your business, in order to drive more inquiry your way. That's what we do here. That's how we roll. And we are brought to you by the very good folk at Net Registry, who basically are there to get your online marketing sorted. Domain name registration, website hosting, website design and development, pay-per-click advertising, search engine optimization, a bit of SEO. That's what they do. And they're very, very good at it. So head over to netregistry.com.au or head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and click on the Net Registry banner and uh, you can see exactly what they have to offer you, the Small Business Big Marketing listener, because um, they're there to help and they are very good guys. Hey, and we're also brought to you by the very good folks at Flying Solo, or at least they listen in. They love listening in, those solopreneurs. Hey, listen, big show today. Want to just touch on the fact that I had a meetup yesterday for Melbourne listeners of the show. That was fantastic. Um, talk about that. And then I need to get stuck straight into the interview because it's a longish interview, but I'm putting it right up there as one of the great interviews of recent times on small business, big marketing. It's with a fellow, Jamie, Jamie and Zimmerman, who has a brand called Travel Sim. And this is. This is, was a hard interview to summarise because we covered so much gold, so much ground. But uh, it's about entrepreneurship. It's about courage. It's just a wonderful, beautiful insight into a guy who's built a wonderful brand. More on that in a minute. So here's the thing. Yesterday had my very first meetup and uh, put it out on meetup.com. You would have heard me talk about it in earlier shows, in more in recent shows. Uh, The fact that if you went to meetup.com forward slash small business big marketing, you could register to come along for a bit of a uh, bit of a chin wag. And we did it. It was in Melbourne. It was a one o'clock lunch uh, just outside of the CBD. Had 38 listeners RSVP, had 26 turn up, which I thought was a great outcome. I honestly didn't know in, in ringing the restaurant to confirm numbers the day before. I'm trying to explain to them, look, you won't quite understand, but I've got this show and I've put it out on Meetup and I don't know anyone who's coming and I don't even know if they'll turn up, but I've had 38 RSVP anyway. They didn't understand what I was talking about. Ended up booking a table for 20, well and truly filled that. And look, it was just great to hang out with fellow listeners. You know, um, as a podcaster, I wouldn't say it's lonely by any stretch. I get lots of emails and feedback via via various channels, but it's just so nice to meet uh, you, the listener, face to face. So thank you to all 26 of you who turned up. Hey, it started at one o'clock and uh, I left about seven o'clock. And there were still some people there. You got to love that. That's your six hour lunch right there. Hmm. Didn't think it was 1983 anymore. Didn't think we the, the, the day of the long lunch had disappeared. Clearly not. It was so good. Everyone hung out for a while, had a good chat. Just great to hang out with other motivated small business owners. So, Going to do that again. Took me a while to get what that one up, and, and thanks to my mate Mick the Mechanic for helping me um, to get that going because there was a bit of pressure, and also to Mark Penny who uh, was also there and kind of put the pressure on me to uh, to get that meetup going. And hopefully I'll do it in other states in the coming months. Um, just been booked uh, for a road show next year already that's going to see me go around Australia, so maybe I'll get in early and book some um Book some, uh, book some meetups. Hey, uh, so thank you to everyone who came. Okay, let's get stuck into this interview because it does go for, I can't remember, maybe it's about 50 minutes, um, but well worth it, guys. So here's the thing. 
Jamie and Zimmerman started a business called Travel Sim about seven years ago. It's what the SIM card that you put in your phone when you go overseas and you no more bill shock. That's basically the problem it solves. And I met Jamie in at a recent roadshow that I was emceeing for Australia Post. And I had to interview Jamie in, in each state. And I just loved A, his business model, A, his brand, the way he went about it. And every time I interviewed him, he was so strong and on message. You know, he was very clear about getting the travel sim message across. And I said, mate, I've got to get you on the show. So that's exactly what I've done. Now, this is an interview, as I said earlier, it's kind of a hard one to summarize, but we start talking about entrepreneurship and the courage it takes and the decisions you've got to you got to make along the way and you know the sometimes you're staring down the barrel other times it's all happy days and everything in between he talks about how he managed that uh, throughout the time we talk about the leverage of partnerships Jamie has developed some incredibly strong partnerships with really big brands we talk about customer service we also talk about the importance of getting an office in a place that's going to help grow your business. And uh, he has a very, very interesting uh, view on where your office should be. So we cover a heap of ground. Uh, Travel Sim is the brand. Jamie and Zimmerman, founder and owner of it, is who is in the studio with me. Here's Jamie and Jamie and Zimmerman, CEO of Travel Sim. Welcome to Small Business Big Marketing. Thanks very much, Tim. Thanks for having me on. Mate, it's a pleasure. Looking forward to this story. It's a good one, I know, and I know our listeners are going to benefit from it. Hey, um, before we get stuck into the serious stuff, if you weren't running Travel Sim, what would you be doing, Jamie? Oh, that's a great question. Um, it, it dawned on me about a year or two ago, uh, the wife was giving me a bit of stick and she said, you're addicted to work. And I said, oh, I just thought it was a joke. And I, and, I, and I realized it dawned on me, it hit me like a ton of bricks. So I actually am addicted to work. So I know that I'll always work. Um, but, you know, I, I like that old saying, if you find something that you love to do, you'll never work a day in your life. So I try and uh, justify it with that. Look, I think my forte now that I, I understand myself a bit better after these last seven or so years with Travel Sim mm. is um, is concept development in the trenches, getting new ideas off the ground. I absolutely love it. I, I'm, I'm uh, a bit of an ideas person. I've always got more ideas. Um, um, I was always an entrepreneur, although I didn't always like that tag. Um, uh, you know, in grade one, I, I, I flogged a couple of pumpkins off a wild vine. It was growing in a churchyard. I'm probably going to go straight to hell for that. Um, and anyway, and took it to school and sold it to my grade one teacher for a dollar. And she said, thank you. And I think grade, grade five, mum, mum gave me a book at Christmas on, you know, little projects for the young boys sort of thing. And one of them was how to make your own boomerang out of plywood. I made this boomerang. It, it did come back the first throw, which astounded me. But, of course, there was an instant business for me in my small country town. And about a month later, I'd made enough to sell to all my mates in this little country town. So I think I'm stuck with the bug. And this concept development and these ideas, I, I really live for. I love the idea. So I guess I'd be doing that, Tim. So so uh, a couple of things there. I'd like to know what, what, what you don't like about the label uh, of entrepreneur. Maybe tell me that first. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. I think... I think it's similar, you know, maybe I'd read stories or, or some entrepreneurs that the way the media portrays them are a bit out there and um, mm. and, and uh, I, um, I was going to use the term of Richard Branson, but, but I, I think he's borderline one of my heroes. But mm-hmm. um, and, and, and I think in the early days that – but I understand why he does it now. He gets out there because he uses his name and his, um, you know, his brand and all the rest of it to, to help get the focus. And I can see why yeah. he, he does what he does, you know, hanging from helicopters and all the rest of it. Um, I think it was along the lines of the of the of the salesman thing. I did, I did in the early days. Um, I thought if you were in sales, you were just like a used car salesman, and you were, you were selling junk to people that didn't need it. Right. Um, and I think that tagline I was a bit confused about, it, but now it sits it sits better with me. I sort of understand. It's a term entrepreneur. Even five years ago, certainly ten years ago, there was a sort of a, a bit of a, a weirdness uh, around it. But now it's kind of it's almost you know, the new black. Yeah, and the other thing I, I guess I should say is most entrepreneurs that we come across in the media have, have in, in, in my opinion, and they might not say this, but they've really made it. Like they're, they're worth hundreds of millions and, and you know, billions of dollars and they're doing, you know, starting airlines and stuff. So when I mm-hmm. think of where I'm at in my my stage of, of my business, I think to myself, I've, I've got a while to go yet. So I don't 
want to mistake people and say, okay, all of a sudden I'm, I should uh, compare myself on the same playing field as a Richard Branson. Now, that's clearly not the case. Yeah, but right. I think that's part of it too. But look, um, I, I've been lucky enough to deal with a few academics over the years and uh, in recent years. And um, yeah, I, I think the entrepreneurial tag um, fits fine. And So Jamie, and the idea then, therefore, that you like bringing ideas to life, does that mean that that idea could be in any industry, in any category? It doesn't, the fact that you've got this product called Travel Sim um, on the assumption that one day you'll move on and start something else, it could be selling um, baby clothes or it could be selling something else, you know, like as long as there is a, a, a new idea there, uh, the category is less relevant? 100%. That is uh, that is it. I, I'm extremely passionate about Travel Sim. I, I built it from the ground up and it was a long, hard road. But um, at the end of the day, it's a vehicle. Uh, it's a vehicle to a, to a personal sort of goal. And uh, so, and and what's more, I love, love the challenge of new industries and um, absolutely 100% correct. It, it does mm. not matter. In fact, I'm even looking at a new venture now, and and one of the little goals might be to um you know build apps for you know in five or six different industries just for a challenge. You know, let's go out and uh, I, you know it's it's the idea of getting to understand a new market and to change it and to come up with products and services that um that improve or or, or, or you know better that industry. And I, I, that's what I love. Are you a classic example of like you honestly have found something you love and you don't really feel as though you work. Yes, in, in in certain times. Um, uh, look, uh, Travel Sim has been going for seven years now, and and I must say that I think the seven year itch is maybe kicking in. And mm-hmm. and let's put that in perspective. Um, you asked me what I, what I would be doing, or, or perhaps what I'd be love to do. What I love to do in this concept development is something that I love. However, um, the day to day running of a bigger business, um, you know, the human resources, the industrial relations, the uh, yeah. this uh, the, yeah. the basic sort of run of the mill stuff doesn't get me out of bed in the mornings. And the, um, the compliance, the compliance, yeah. And uh, I hire, obviously we hire people these days to help us with that. But uh, um, as CEO, you've still got to be across all of this stuff. And um, look, uh, I was brought up to work hard. I, I do it. I get in there and I come to work and I and I and I get stuck in it and get it done. But um, all I'm saying is, uh, it doesn't necessarily excite me as much as the um, as the concept development, the the um, you know the, the the marketing development side of things. Are, are you um are you too focused on the detail? Does that get in the way and and where you should be kind of more macro? Yes, that's a, that's I think that's a very common um, uh, a, a, a common thing to say about many business owners is that you, mm. you in what we say at our level is where we're stuck in the um, operations. Uh, my general manager and I look at each other every day and say we've been sucked into the vortex again, the yeah, vortex yeah, yeah. of operations. And and um, but it's an easy tag to throw away, throw, throw down, isn't it? At the end of the day, um, we're invested in this business. Um, I've been accused before of, oh, this is your baby, Jamie, and don't call it ugly. You could never leave this. You could never walk away. I think that view is not correct. The, the problem is I've been here since day one. I know more about it than anybody else, of course. That's not that's not a, an arrogant thing to say mm. simply because I made it. I've, I've been here since day one. What's, make, what, what's even worse is that every day that goes on, I've been here longer than anybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one can catch up, can they? So, um, and, and, and what's, what's happened is, is a lot of the decision-making that I do now is very instinctual and I – I look at across the table at my manager sometimes and think to myself, "Why don't you know this? Why, why, mm. do you, why is it taking you so long?" And it's because you know we've got to give them credit for where they're at. I, I look at so many uh, founders of small businesses that have become successful. And I think that must be one of the hardest things is to um, you know give birth. Um, and to, to a business idea, to bring it to life, to make it successful. And at some point, slowly, it's like raising a child. At some point, you've got to slowly hand it over to others. And that just must be really, really difficult and frustrating at times. It is because it doesn't happen as quick. And when you make that decision in your mind that um, it's time, let, let, let's, let's look at a slightly bigger point here. Mm. I, I have a, a view that no single business uh, anywhere in the world e- that's ever been made will survive forever unless they adapt. Um, I can give you heaps of examples, but the simple one is I think I think Wattle Paints, I think has been in Australia for 100 years or so. You know, when they started out, they were probably selling lead-based paint. I dare say there's not much lead-based paint on their shelves at the moment. Probably um, none. The point is you must be able to adapt and you must um, – and sometimes that adaptation um, can take you outside of the industry. You're in, you, 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 I think we're not scared of that at Travel Sim, mm. where we think to ourselves our future – is this being able to adapt? Now, where that ties back into am I stuck in the detail, am I stuck in the operations, um, is that you have to get out of the operations because you have to look strategically at the business and think, okay, well, 
I don't really want to plan our demise, but if we clearly, if we don't adapt in this amount of time and, and come up with other revenue streams or other products or other markets, mm. then we won't be around. And so um, we're not scared of that. We, we, we face it head on and actually, uh, quite frankly, I'm excited by it. So to me, um, it's not only that it's frustrating being stuck in the detail and, and feeling like sometimes you can't get out. Um, it's 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 the very fact that if you don't, well, you know, the dream will be over one way or another, won't it? Correct. Yeah. Does, does being stuck in the detail, I wonder, sometimes mean that you haven't found someone? And I've met some of your team, and they appear to me to be just bloody solid blokes. But have you? Does sometimes it mean you haven't found someone that you fully trust to take control of what it is you've created? Yeah, that's been levelled. Um, a lot of people sort of come. That's that's sort of a a common thing that. That people I hear people say to me or say to other uh, business owners as well or, or entrepreneur type owners, um, it, it it may be true. I think it's a strong word to say you don't trust somebody. I think mm. it all comes back to the whole the knowledge thing when it's almost instinctual. Uh, I, I can sort of have, I've got a real strong feel for the business. It's just not feasible to expect someone to walk in and get that. But look. The, the, the whole thing's right. I, I, and one of my accountants once said to me that, Jamian, um, consider these managers, these people that you're bringing on as spinning plates. They're spinning your good china and occasionally they're going to drop some. Um, if you're going to, if that's the end of the world for you, that's someone that's going to drop your china, good china, then mm. don't don't worry about it. Stay in the business, do the operations and, and run your business that way. But if you really want to move away from that and move into other areas, then you'll have to trust people. Uh, they will drop the china. They will make mistakes. Um, like you made mistakes, and um, you know you just have to accept that. And uh, I think um, you know, it, it, I think I, I do a lot of reading in business books. And one of the things that sticks out to me of recent books I've been reading is um, the right people doing the right things. So you are right; it's it's vital that you find the right people in those positions, and that they're mm. doing the right things. What um, book was that in? I think that was the Rockefeller Habits, mm-hmm. which I one of the best business. Well. It's one of those books. Occasionally, you, I, I do a fair bit of reading, but uh, of these business books, these self help books, because I've always think there's a snippet in, in each one of them that yes. you can take away. I, I love it, and um, it's, it's, you've got to keep bettering yourself. Um, but that book uh, came along almost at perfect timing for me, so I, I highly recommend it. But but I, I can see clearly that if your business is at that stage, um, that that book is is one of the better books I've ever. Isn't read. it interesting when things do come along? You, you, sometimes we don't acknowledge that. In fact, we don't even have the uh, the radar on to see it. But things do come along. I mean, that's a bit of a woo woo discussion uh, for another time, maybe. But um, things do come along at certain times for the for reasons. Well, um, and I'd say to your listeners, to your to your guys in the trenches out there doing doing the work, is um just stay in the business <laughs> yeah. because. This is what happens. It's amazing, and don't change your telephone numbers. Whatever you do, because you just get your hand out a card at an expo or, or at a meeting, and two or three years later, someone rings you. Go, oh, are you still doing those SIM card things? Yeah, I need a thousand, or I've got this overseas. You know, so the thing is, you know, stay in the race. If you think if you think you're under a good thing and you've you've done your marketing well, um, then and you think you think you're in the right place, and then stay in business. Um, you know, persist because um, yes, um, things do land in your lap. And I was always told this. I didn't believe it. I'm um, always told that swings and roundabouts and treat people well because it always comes around. I think, well, when's karma coming around for me? It doesn't yeah, feel yeah, right, yeah. But, but it does. I'd say that to you, to to, you, to my fellow entrepreneurs listening yeah. to um to stay in the game if you're if you're onto the right thing and uh, because things will come around. Mate, well, let's talk specific. That's a wonderful conversation we've just had about entrepreneurship and 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 a, a, one I haven't had on the show for a while. Tell us, Travel Sim, what what is it and where did the idea come from? Okay, so Travel Sim uh, is the mobile phone service for international travellers. It's a smart SIM card that you put into your mobile phone when you go overseas. Uh, it's not designed to replace your existing mobile. It's just a SIM card you use when you travel overseas. Um, it's designed to to avoid or, or you know to, to to not get those crazy roaming charges that we see. Um, you know, and our voice charges are you know 80, 90, 95 percent cheaper than the standard sort of roaming that's out there in the market. Wow. Um, so it's not. And, and look, I've been in telecommunications for a lot of years, and uh, I remember when I when I worked for one of the big guys there years ago um you know we, we used to go out and tell small businesses um you know change to this company because you'll, you'll save all this money and it, yeah, it, right. it, it amounted to five cents a month it wasn't worth the time to fill out the paperwork but but you know it really is big savings and roaming you know we're free to receive calls in 120 odd countries where the other carriers are charging you know dollar two dollars two dollars fifty a minute to receive calls uh so it doesn't get much better than that. So the idea came along. I, I'd been in telecommunication sales, working for the big guys for a few years. Um, I'd left uh, one of those and, and written some software that analysed phone bills. So I guess at, 
at the time that this this thing come across my desk, um, I had a what you'd probably call an expert understanding of telecommunications billing, including international roaming, and, and I knew that nothing was being done about it. And it was very expensive, um, and this thing sort of landed on my lap. Someone uh, exposed me to the opportunity, mm. um, and then I went into research mode, and and away we went. That's sort of how it came about. So I, I, I guess in summary, I, I understood very very clearly uh, the telecommunications scene in Australia at the time. Um, and I knew there wasn't, I didn't see any answers out there to roaming really. So I thought, well, there must be a, must be a business in this somewhere. Classic problem identification. You had the solution. Uh, what you didn't have was cash. So how did you get this puppy to market in the early days? <laughs> oh, look, this, this is one of the, I know I've told you, Tim, but this is one of those, um, I was going to say rags to riches or the second yeah. still coming true. But uh, look, the, the, oh, look. Oh, really? Uh, really? <laughs> hey, you're telling me after seven years, the riches aren't showing themselves. I don't believe you. I've got goals, Tim. I'm still still dri- oh, I'm still driving a Hilux, Tim. <laughs> no. you're good on you. Well, you've got to just carry all those tools around, mate, because you're always, you know, you're always on the tools. But um, I'm going to get you to wrap some numbers around it in a minute. But before, before we do that, um, yeah. So, how, how did you get it to market in those in those in that first you know six months, twelve months? Look, yes, it was more like three years. What what had happened is I, I identified an opportunity. Um, I got mixed up with a crowd that 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 had a similar product that um, that uh, was probably a poor decision. But whilst I'd done that, I'd researched the world and realised there was one or two, maybe three suppliers in the world that could do this. I, I, I wrote a proposal to one of those and said I'd like to be the person in this part of the world that. That sells or promotes this uh, particular technology. Um, I bought it. it. Turns up at my doorstep. You know, three blank SIM cards and three bits of paper saying that's travel SIM. Go your go your hardest. Wow! And um, from there, I had to teach myself. I, I look. I thought, well, I need a website. I, I hadn't actually learnt HTML. So, so it was a pre-existing product. You you bought the license to it. Well, it was a, I, I bought the technology, that, if you like, or, or, or I still buy the, the the phone calls, if you like. We call it airtime and industry. So, what I had to do is I had to wrap that up into a product that for the Australian market, from scratch, um, with no cash, um, and. What's more is that the, the time I spent on um, trying to get the travelsome off the ground pulled me away from my existing um, consultancy business in this telecommunications um, yeah. analysis. So, yeah, making you know, your money. Yeah, the, 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 and, and, and you make these mistakes. And in any case, um, but what I'd done, Tim, and one of the big things that I, that I got right here was I really, really researched um, the market. I understood that those days right down to the single digits, how many Australians were going overseas, where they were going, how old they were, how long they were going for, um, and, and I was able to uh, really understand where I thought the market was because I knew that I didn't have millions of dollars. I, I knew that I, I couldn't go and attract millions of dollars at that stage for a venture like this, so I'd have to do it um, on the bare bones, on the smell of an oily rag. So you did a lot, a lot of quantitative stuff. Um, I guess the qualitative stuff there too was that seven years ago, you know, the idea of using your phone when you went overseas was just like that was laughable. I mean, even now I think people still hold that perception that you're just not going to do it. It's going to be too expensive. I found myself uh, both times travelling overseas this year where I've just, you know, first thing I've done is raced out to get a SIM card at a local, you know, local shop somewhere. Um, but back then people must have really – I mean, it just wouldn't have been something you'd consider. Yes, but um, you know that that's right. Uh, and, and, and I've always said we had an, a, a new market altogether, a brand new market of people that weren't taking their mobile phone at all overseas. Mm. We knew a lot of people were travelling, and it was growing. Um, uh, so a lot of Australians were heading off overseas, um, and, and that was a growing market. Um, so uh, we knew that mobile phones, even at that stage, um, there was more active mobile phone services in Australia than than, than living Australians. Mm-hmm. So we knew that. that they probably want to take their mobile phone overseas, and I, I just understood that very clearly. But I guess um, I really want to stress the point that um, I was once told in a sales position the, the new boss walked in and threw the yellow pages down on the desk and said, there's your territory, son, go your hardest. <laughs> he, he should have just said, you know, you're the T's, go after any business starting with a T yeah. because it was almost too much. It was like, oh, where do I start? I spent weeks and weeks running around in circles and not getting anywhere, spinning the wheels. What I did with um, Travelsim was say, okay, we are going after this. We, we, we were going after this type of person because we think it'll work for us and, and identified it from there. So, so, so who was that person? So, because you've got some numbers, you know who's traveling overseas, you know who, how many are taking their phone, how many aren't, you know why, because they're scared of bill shock. Um, what, what were, who was that? Was that person, was it a, tra- a business traveler? Was it families? Who were they? Yeah, well, it wasn't a business traveler. 76% of all travel out of Australia is for leisure or holiday travel, and 19% for business, and the bit rest over, I think, is military and, and, mm-hmm. and um, uh, education and things like that. So, 
I had a corporate sales background and understood very, very clearly that the sales cycle on business, especially in telecommunications, is very long. And what this means is that if you're well into, if you're lucky enough to get in front of the, the the CIO or the CEO or the decision makers of the business, if you're lucky enough to get in front of that person. Um, they'll want to go through a cost-benefit analysis. They'll want to consider their current contractual commitments. And what it, all this means is that it can take you six, nine months, 12 months before you start seeing some money come through the door from that sale. And you've mm. got to carry that cost the whole time. Mm. It's, it's, these business and corporations, it's not a, um, oh, yeah, we'll take one of those right now necessarily. It, it's usually some sort of process that's got to be going through. So I knew this and I, and I thought, well, even though they probably they, they spend a lot more money per SIM card, the 80-20 rule, uh, in this particular case, I think there's a lot of punters going over there. There's 76% and there are millions and millions. Maybe we should be going after those guys and, and getting us to the market. So that was the first decision. So non, we were non-business focused at that stage of the game simply because I, I, I assumed that it would be hard for me to get enough numbers through the door in the early days. Now, we did get a lot of businesses, it turned out. We have, we have many large corporations using it, which is testament to the product. Um, now, the second thing I did, and this is going back seven years, mind you, this is not now. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing I did was identify that p- the assumption was this was for backpackers. The problem with the backpacker market is they they, they, they travel on a budget. So <laughs> they probably don't. In my, I made a, an assumption that they would probably just go into an internet cafe and use Skype because mm-hmm. and not even worry about a mobile phone because – that that'll do the trick for them. They're, they're on a real shoestring budget. So, but then I thought to myself, well, the forty plus year olds who are going overseas, which there was a lot of them going overseas for longer, actually have probably more money at um, at hand uh, at that stage of their career, and also have a much bigger reason to have to call home. One being a young family, um, but also ties to business and, and friends and all the rest of it. So, that's where we sort of positioned our um, positioned our products. Now, I think those decisions early on were, were um, held us in good stead. So yeah, well, you've, you have not fallen into the trap, Jamie, of trying to be everything to everyone, which you know is so seductive, so tempting as a as, as a business of any age, but particularly as a young business, as you're trying to establish some cash flow, you just think, God, you know, we we'll throw it all up against the wall and hope some of us some of it sticks. Yeah, that's right. Exactly right. And you just can't do that. And um, there's some really cool stuff out there now, and um, on on product development and concept development. Um, you know, the, the lean sort of startup stuff. And uh, mm-hmm. it, it, I think it's in a way it relates to that. Don't don't try and be everyone, everyone, and um, to a certain degree. Mate, that's a great book. We've mentioned that a number of times, listeners. But the lean startup, which is written by the professor of entrepreneurship at Harvard, fantastic book. Yeah, well, it's pretty smart, isn't it? I, I thought it was quite. When I read that, I thought, what, you know, I thought to myself, geez, what? An, I wish I'd read that seven years. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, look, the, yeah. um, you know, so I, I, you know, I'm not sitting here saying that I did, every, uh, and, and I would never, and he would never hear me say I did everything perfect, and, and here we are. It's not not that case at you all. You told me before I hit record that you you haven't made a mistake. <laughs> So don't try and trip me up, I think, were your words. Oh, no, no. I'll tell you what. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's uh, <laughs> you just make some mistakes. It's fantastic. Well, tell me, mate. Uh, let, let, let's, I want to hear about mistakes. Um, wrap some, we're, seven years on, Travel Sim is a successful brand. That's why you're on the Small Business Big Marketing Show. Wrap some numbers around it. 250 odd thousand Australians have taken a, um, a Travel Sim overseas um, to date, and, and we're still growing. Um, we have. Australia Post as a as a as a, um, a, a retail uh, as a customer as, as as a retail partner, um, as as well as all phones and Dick Smiths, um, the, the the Jet Set Travel Group, which is your Harvey Worlds, uh, the NRMA, RACQ, RA. Wow! So it's it's quite incredible. It's um, mate, that is well partnership uh, partnership strategy. We're going to talk about that. That that's fantastic. Um, what? Uh, okay, so two hundred fifty thousand Australians, major partnerships with major brands, uh, number of staff. 65 um, on, on the books this year. With um, We have a cyclical business in our business, which means um, at certain times of year, Australians travel more than other times, which means um, our customer support um, workload increases tr- dramatically. So um, we, we, we use uh, uh, casual, um, part-time casual workforce. Um, in fact, we positioned our business consciously near a university to pick up smart young people looking for 12 to 20 hours work a week during our busy times, and that's been a been a masterstroke, to be honest with you. Masterstroke? A, a major decision around office location was um, being close to a university to get good staff. Yeah, that's one of those ones where I can claim that I actually sat down one day and said, where are we going to put this thing uh, when, it, when it gets big enough? Because it, it st- literally started. It didn't start in its own bedroom. It was too too small for that. It started in the corner of the existing bedroom. <laughs> it, then, it then got big enough to have its own bedroom in the in the two-bedroom unit. Yeah. Um, we went to a serviced office after that. 
Um, and then, then we went to our first office space. And I'm, I, Near I, a uni. Every single year of the business, we've expanded our office space, Tim. Isn't that an amazing stat? But you've got to put it in perspective. We started in a room. <laughs> yeah, 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 correct. Tell, tell me, uh, can you give us any numbers? Can you give, tell us an annual turnover? Yeah, we're about $11 million. I, I don't mind saying this. $11 yeah. million um, um, turnover last year. I'm not going to give you the margins, Tim, though. I know you probably want that. But um, mm-hmm. the- No, you were saying before I hit record, I think you were saying there's about <laughs> 70% margins. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, I gave the low end. <laughs> Look, the, the thing is, I always find funny, and this is another funny thing your, yeah. your listeners will find as their businesses go through levels of, uh, of, of, of I guess, success. Um, it's funny how people quote, quote turnover, isn't it? Um, because turnover is meaningless. Yeah, yeah, um, correct. I, I, I could have just said to you it was hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, turnover is not really an important number, but that's a but bigger business. Does. What is the important number? Well, it's margin, isn't it? I mean, would you right. have, would you want a million customers giving you one cent, or would you, you know, would you like you know just, just a couple of customers giving you a million dollars? I mean, Correct. really, uh, you know, this is this is very important stuff, and it, it relates back to the decision on where, where what market you choose. Um, don't try and be everything to everyone, and you've got to try and choose a. And, and you're in business, and part of the reason you're in business is to make some money. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I use an analogy. Um, a lot of my competitors and a lot of the telco industry, not, not only in Australia but in a lot of the developed countries around the world, have got this race to the bottom on pricing, this crazy mm-hmm. race to the bottom, um, mm-hmm. you know. and, and Can't finish in one place. Well, look, it can, and, and what happens is they uh, margins get smaller, so they they look at their cost and they go, oh, customer service is a cost. I better cut that. They cut their customer service. They lose some more customers and you get, you get on this downward spiral. Um, I use the analogy that you know, tomorrow I might enter the staple of business, Tim. I might go and I might go and put a new stapler on the shelves. Now I've got a choice. Do I? Yeah. Do I go out and um? Do I go out and look at the market and say, oh, there we go. The average price for a stapler at all your all your office works is is five dollars. What I can do is I might talk to the Chinese and find a cheaper way to manufacture and distribute this and get it down to four bucks fifty. And I'll go and enter the market at at, at four bucks fifty and have this price leadership and away I'll go. I just think that's wrong, wrong, wrong. And um, why don't why don't we think about it? This why don't we enter the uh, the elite stapler market of of which there is none? Why don't we go and convince I don't know Kelly Slater comes to mind and get him to sign our staplers and we'll sell them Kelly for, Stapler yeah and we'll sell them for two hundred and fifty bucks each. Now it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but mm-hmm. I bet you there's a small market out there of people who would love to have a Kelly, Slat, Kelly yeah. stapler uh, stapler now. Please, if Kelly Slater gets on this, I don't, I'm not using your trademark, Kelly. I'm, um, it, it's all right, mate. I've already registered Kelly Slater staplers and I've registered kellystapler.com. Yeah, see, that's the point. That's the point. It's not um, – I, 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 I just think that, you know, um, when you're a small entrepreneur and you're out there um, doing your best and you look at these big businesses, you, 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 your assumption, especially my assumption, is that they must be really smart. They must be really, really good and have these incredible marketing departments and this department and that department and the firepower they've got against us, um, it's completely wrong, everybody. It's not like that at all. Um, you, you've probably got more smart sitting in your one-man business than a lot of these big businesses have on, on certain subject areas. Um, and some of these fundamentals of business, the big guys either get wrong or they're doing it for other reasons. They're in a different level of business. They're in a whole different world um, the way they play the game. So mm-hmm. ignore what they're doing. Don't try and understand it, but um, you know, be a bit smart. If you can sell you know, 100 Kelly staplers, um, then uh, um, you might be better off than trying to sell 10,000, um, you know, um, blue ones in an office works for two bucks or something. Listeners, I'm talking to Jamie Zimmerman, CEO of Travel Sim. Jamie, tell me, um, was there a point along the way where you got the wobbles uh, and thought, oh, geez, hang on, I don't know whether uh, this is going to work out how I want it to? Next time you're on the Gold Coast, Tim, um, I'll shout you out for a beer, but come up and I'll take you to the spot on the beach where I turned to my wife and said, this sucker's not going to fly, darling. I think I'll go back to labouring. <laughs> oh. And um, we, we had a saying that got us through. And, and, and you know, the, the saying behind every uh, good man's a good woman, whatever it is, that, um, yeah. that could not be possibly true. I, 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 I doubt we'd be anywhere near where we are without my beautiful wife, Esma. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and, and basically it was, uh, you know, get back in the game, mate. <laughs> get back in the game, you slacker. And I won't tell you the exact words she used. but No, tell us. Tell uh, us. I want to know. No, it's, it's too many swear words. <laughs> Go. It doesn't matter. This is uh, not. We had a saying that said that um, uh, we had a saying. Um, I, I spent a couple of years on cattle stations at my aunties and uncles um, years ago, and I used to, used to turn to my wife and say, "Well, we can always go and chase cows." In other words, it was a burn the boat strategy. Get out there. Um, if you're going to do it, go go in there, uh, balls and all. I was going to say, please. It'd be mm. great to see in the media tomorrow, Tim. <laughs> um, but the thing is, uh, um, you know, um, uh, persist. Get out there and keep going. And, and yes, there was a couple of really key occasions where I thought to myself, if we don't get a couple of sales tomorrow, 
I'm going to pull the pin. The stress is too much. The financial, the cash flow pressure in those early days. It was the cash flow pressure, was it? It's it's all about the cash flow pressure in those early yeah. days, and it was self funded, and um, we we'd put everything on it, everything we had, which wasn't a great deal, and we put it on the line, and um, you know, and we had big deals that just went west on decisions out of our control, and um, it's 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 uh. It's it's heart wrenching. Actually, I'll tell you a funny story. Very very early on in the business, we only, and at this stage, I think I had around about a thousand customers, or I had a thousand people use Travel Sim. It was a c- couple years into the business, um, and uh, I was doing all of the customer service twenty four by seven on my personal mobile phone. So what would happen? I was it was in a two bedroom unit. That was the office setup. And, I, and, and as you, what you're trying to do in those days is make yourself look bigger than what you mm-hmm. are. So you're providing this expert customer service. So people will be ringing up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and I'd jump out of bed and say, Travel Sim, Jamie and speaking, how can I help you? Um, I'd like to speak to your accounts team, please. One second, I'll put you through to the accounts team. Accounts team, how can I help you? <laughs> you know, I actually <laughs> did that. That's 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 actually uh, something I did to make a sound bigger. There was one person the whole time running it. I got to about 5,000 customers on my own, Tim. No did help. you really? I know, crazy stuff. Just 24 by 7, 14, 16, 18 hours a day, diving out of bed on, on a couple of hours sleep and being fresh as days, but loving it, to tell you the truth. I was in there having a crack. Um, and so, um, yeah, things thing, things were tight, and uh, um, you know, and, and, and a couple of times there, it was really on the wire. It was, um, do, you know, do we keep going or not? And um, I was forgot I was actually got the story I was going to tell you, but in any case, um, that's know, a good story in itself. A, a big, exactly right. And big, some big things just went west, and we we thought we were across the line, and nearly ready to celebrate, and um, it all just fell over and, and started again. And um, the story was, sorry, we, I, got an, I got an order in the early days from from, um, from from Telstra, from seven marketing executives of Telstra going overseas, and um, I thought, oh, these buggers are just getting started and just seeing the first runs on the board, and they're trying to knock me off already, and I'm, this big giant's going to crush me, and it's all over. It's all over. This, this big, I'm, I can't believe it. So I didn't fulfill the order. And I got this phone call about a week later saying, you know, where's our order? We'd really like to get our SIM cards. We're leaving mm-hmm. soon. I said, well, what's wrong with you guys? You know, I'm a, I'm a nothing little tiny player, little punter having a go. Why are you trying to get – and this lady said, oh, it's nothing like that. Now, we're going overseas and uh, roaming's turned off on our SIM cards and we just like to use an Australian company, use yours. <laughs> so I thought, oh. there we go. I've got the beautiful niche market there. Um Telstra marketing executives going overseas. So, you know, um, it's funny how these 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 things are gut wrenching at the time. But you know, so, so Jamie, and tell me, mate, uh, th- there must have then been a point on the other side of the coin where you've looked at the lovely Esma and said, "Geez, darling, I think this. I think we're onto something." <laughs> well, I think I go back to that point on the um, on the marketing research. Um, it, Look, we knew there were people getting ripped off on roaming. We we knew, and that they were in there, tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of people, millions, in fact, really, who were taking their phones overseas, who were a bit unaware, didn't really understand. When it says five dollars a minute, it actually means for every minute on your phone, you're getting charged five dollars. You could have a one hundred dollar phone call. There wasn't much data around back then, but so data's a bigger problem now. But um, you know, people were, you know, and I, I can give you hundreds and hundreds of stories. And an old lady rang me once, and very old. She was going over back over to. Uh, Malta to to visit her, her family she hadn't seen for many many years and she said listen I only spend ten dollars a month on my home phone your sim card's fifty dollars I'm not sure if I can justify it um, and we talked and talked this I, I talked to this lady I was doing customer service and we and we and she agreed that it was a bit too much for her and that she'd try not to use a mobile phone anyway she lands in Malta and they lost her luggage and she spent an hour on the phone and got a phone bill for three hundred and sixty five dollars. And she rung up crying, and 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 because she didn't really understand telco, when she when she got back, she'd called me crying, saying, "You know, can you please pay this bill for me? Can you help out?" And I think, you know, those sort of stories, you thought, okay, look, you know what? We can. There's people out there getting rorted. They just don't don't understand that there's an alternative. We've got to keep fighting here. There's a market here. There's money to be made. We've got a good product. Just stick with it and keep trying. So you know, one of the things, Jamie, that I'm just hearing from you in this story is that that power, those first five thousand phone calls, those first five thousand clients that you provided customer service to, jumping out of your bed at three in the morning. Is there anything more powerful than having that conversation with your customers? Well, no, and uh, we have a DNA um, to the way our business started because I, I wasn't scared of doing that. Um, I, di- I didn't think it was um, you know, below me to get on the phone, and I still don't to my customers. Um, well, that's held us in good stead, isn't it? it? It forms one of the three pillars of our of our um, of our mantra at Travel Sim is this customer service. Um, it's just so important. Um, it's hard enough getting one, and this is the other thing I don't understand about some of my bigger competitors out there is that the way they treat their customers. I just don't really get it. Every you know, business one hundred and one, marketing one hundred and one. It's harder to, to um, you know, to get you know to get them to, to you know all, all those things. Don't lose your customers. Treat them well. Tre- and you know, 
I just think that it's held us in such great stead that every single person in this business right now can jump on the phone if called upon, um, from from the admin um, person to the receptionist to the CEO to the GM marketing. Uh, anyone can jump on the phone and take a support call and, and, and give it a fair crack because well, that's that that Zappos, um, you know that that shoe company in America, Zappos. Um, they've got that whole model of, in fact, not only can anyone jump on and address a customer service issue, they've also got an amount of money that every single person in that business can spend without seeking approval. And it's quite a significant amount of money. And I'm talking, I don't, 100, 200 bucks, where you can go and send a customer some flowers or you can arrange something to be fixed without actually having to get it approved. And uh, I think it's in the book, Selling Happiness. Great book. Yeah, I should, I, I've, heard, I've heard that story before. But I'm not sure if I've read that one. But um, look, and this, this goes back to um, your listeners out there as well. Do you really want to go and work for a business, in fact, your business, um, if they're cutting corners on customers, if they're not treating customers how you'd like to be treated. Well, my simple philosophy is this. I'm lucky enough to own the business. I built it from scratch. I don't want to come in here each day and see corners cut there. I want people to be treated mm. how I'd like to be treated. And I'm getting old, Tim, getting old and snobby. Yeah, yeah. Well, so. uh, mate, for listeners, this is a, an audio interview, but I can tell you now, Jamie looks more like Kojak than he does uh, Gene Simmons. <laughs> Lots of hair. Uh. <laughs> so look, uh, look at the end of the day, Look at the end of the day, um, you know, and that's that's our mantra. Is, you know, uh, customer service is actually really simple. You don't need to know anything. Like you, you can come and do customer service today, Tim, as long as you remember a couple of simple rules: treat people how you'd like to be treated, and do your best every time. And Love if you it. simply do that stuff, and that, that's I, I try and repeat that to my um, my team daily because if you do that stuff and, and you've got no knowledge and no training, well, you, you'll say to the person, "Listen, I don't really know what I'm doing here, but say right there." I'm going to find someone who does know what they're talking. Correct. We'll get the answer for you. But if you follow those simple rules and customer service and treat your customers well, well, at the very least, it makes it better to come to work, doesn't it? Simple as that. Tell me, um, there, there must be competitors undercutting you, and they're always in any industry. You know, we're all, we're always going to experience that pricing battle, which ends in tears. Um, how do you avoid going down that path? And just continuing to hammer home the fact that we'll never let you down. We have the best customer service. We've got the best product. Our quality is better than the rest of the marketplace. Because there's massive courage in there because you think at some point, you know, we, we're going to lose that battle and the rest, the whole market's going to go with the cheapest. Well, look, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, I, I think the word's courage. Um, a few years ago, a, um, a brand popped up and said, you know, we can do three cent phone calls in China, and and I think ours was a dollar a minute, and they were, they were saying three cents a minute. That's a fair difference in price. Yeah, I, massive. I didn't think it was possible, but their marketing and their advertising was very heavy. I, I got out of bed that morning after reading that that PR release and come into work early and put all my prices up by five percent. And I did that because to remind myself that do not follow this path. Just kick your head down and and uh, and keep doing what you're doing, and so it's it's the courage is the word. If if you believe in what you're delivering is a good product, and you can't be stupid about it, you've got to go out and see what the market's doing. Um, but look, uh, the point is, if your product survives in the market. Um, its only proposition is price and you're there because you've got a cheaper phone call, then you won't last forever and you'll be knocked off. And to be realistic, Tim, um, every day I wake up and see that. At the end of the day, one of the reasons that Travel Sims had such amazing success, let's just be totally realistic, is simply because our call rates are so much cheaper than roaming. Now, we are seeing an absolute myriad of niche competitors into the market. In the last few days, we've seen some of the big carriers start to drop their roaming rates. So if we don't adapt, if we don't put in place a strategy um, and if we stay as the our proposition is not just price, by the way, because we've been saying this for years and years. Um, but but in other words, we've got other things that make travel some a brilliant thing to take overseas. Even if it was the same cost as um, you know a, a bigger player, you sh- I'd still take travel sim. From we can get to that later. But the point is. You've got it. You've got to be able to say if if, if you just in price. We, uh, my, my general manager says if you're if the only proposition you ha- proposition that you have in business is price, you're not actually in business. It's something else. You're not actually trying to go out. And if that proposition may be customer service, and I'm seeing all sorts of businesses out there these days who are realising this. It's like we for some some somewhere along the line, business forgot it, <laughs> forgot that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's actually about the customer. Yeah, funny that you got three pillars of the business, Jamie, and customer service. My, our, our a few years ago, you talk about things that happen in the business and you wonder if they're door closing sort of um, um, events. And one of the things that used to keep me up at night and I'd, I'd wake up and, and just couldn't sleep was um, was this whole price proposition and knowing that sooner or later 
uh, one of the big boys is going to drop their rates and, 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 and get me out of the market. I was sort of thinking to myself, it doesn't matter how good a guy you are, Jamie, and if it's only 10% cheaper to take travel sim, then people will go, you know what, Jamie's a good guy, but it's just easier for me to stick with my existing sim card. I'll take that overseas. So I, I, this has stressed me out because I hadn't we hadn't sort of made any money at this stage of the game. We we're putting every cent that we made back into the business, and I thought, well, I haven't made it yet. I, I, I can't bear the thought of having done four years of extremely hard work and, and not get a brass razoo out of it. I, I, don't, I, I, didn't, I wasn't even paying myself for the first three years wasn't making enough money so i thought what's the strategy and this is the important thing about business isn't it and our strategy is international expansion um value-added services expansion and the best customer service in the world and we wake up and say that every day so international expansion means we know what we've achieved in australia is is coveted or wanted by other markets around the world um, we, our systems are, are, are cookie cutter type systems. We can white label it and plonk the systems in any country of the world anytime we like. They're multilingual, multi currency, all the rest of it. So we built those systems. Let's go and expand internationally because the likelihood of those markets all collapsing on price at the same time is very, very remote. The second thing is the fun part, and this is where Jamie loves to play, is the value added services. What else does TravelSim do? Is it just a cheaper phone call? Or can it do more things for me when we travel? And we've released a whole lot of value-added services uh, already, and some of those value-added services projects are now morphing into their own revenue opportunities. Um, so that's the whole idea. It's, like what? Well, look, um, I, <laughs> go on. Do you want the scoop or not, <laughs> <laughs> mate? We love scoops on small business, big marketing. We've written this incredible application, um, this this mobile app that's about to launch in the next few weeks. Um, you don't have to have TravelSim to use it, but it, it does make TravelSim uh, a, a lot better even again. Um, it corrects international dialing on the fly. We know from research that Australians in particular, compared to our European cousins, have a bit of trouble with dialing international numbers, getting codes right, using 0011, leaving zeros in when they shouldn't. I know the exact figures for TravelSim because obviously we have the data. Mm -hmm. um, our application doesn't require any data access. It's offline, they call it, and is able to correct those numbers wherever you are in the world. You could be sitting in Germany, dial the local number without the area yeah, code, it. and it will correct it for you. So so what you're doing, you recognised um, that there you're in the business of providing cheap phone calls when overseas and avoiding bill shock, but there is actually a whole lot of other things that happen when you're overseas around phone calls, around keeping in touch, around communication, that these value-add things are going to uh, just give the brand a much greater depth and richness than it would if it was just a cheap phone call. I just want to uh, correct you there. You're using the term cheap phone call. We never say that. It's a cheaper phone call. Um, it's a cheaper phone call in the competitions because sorry, sorry, Mr. Sorry, right. Mr. Zimmerman, <laughs> Mr. Travel Sim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, cheap, cheap things. People then assume that it's cheap. When we're not cheap, we use the same networks as the other carriers use. with the same types of agreements. Mate, I love, I love even even the fact that you pulled me up there. It, 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 when I first met you, you are very clear on your key messages. And listeners, you got to listen to this. Um, when I met Jamie, and it was I was uh, emceeing and hosting this thing for Australia Post, this Australia Post TV kind of thing that was happening around Australia at these different ex exhibition buildings. And I had the opportunity to interview Jamie and each time about travel sim, and it was beamed up into the hall that we were in, the exhibition centres. And, mate, you, you, you're, you're always on key message, and I've done a lot of interviews, and it's amazing how many small business owners just aren't – they're not disciplined enough to correct people. You know, when you talk about my brand, this is how you talk about it. And um, when you get everyone singing from the same songbook, you actually build a strong brand. Yeah, and you just have to. And um, I think I told you the story about uh, one time I went down to Adelaide to train up a whole bunch of retail store managers. I won't mention the brand. Um, and these guys were coming into a rolling three-day sort of training ec conference and, you know, groups of 30 each time. And, I, and I, I conducted this training to these guys on Travelsome and how to sell Travelsome back in your stores. And this was in South Australia. Um, at the end of each one of these sessions, I almost got a standing ovation. I actually got personal phone calls and personal emails saying, probably the best training we've ever had. You're passionate. You know your subject area. Brilliant. Didn't sell a SIM card in South Australia for 30 days after that, Tim. And, and, and I thought, what the hell? These guys love the training. And what was yeah. happening is the managers weren't going back to the stores and, and, and being able to relay the information or they were just getting caught up in the day-to-day -day, uh, running of the business. So then that, that, that was a really good stark lesson and one we never forgot. N now, you know, you've got to break things down. I think um, Tony Abbott's been copping quite a bit of stick about three-word slogans, but it's actually a really – very, very important business mm -hmm. uh, skill to have because Absolutely. take the clear message away because pe people's lives are full of information. We're overloaded. And what are we really trying to achieve here? So we broke our sales tip down into, um, you know, 
um, uh, um, I, I just got a mental blank thing. So I was thinking about Tony Abbott. <laughs> 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 you know, give out a brochure with every tra- with every uh, travel product sold. Uh, you know, have a travel day once a month and ring us on our, su- our our priority support line whenever you need us. And do you know what our sales went through the roof? Isn't that incredible? Wow. It, it, well, it, yes, it is, but no, it isn't because you've just simplified everything and cut to the chase. And and uh, Michael Crawford, who I interviewed a few weeks ago, he opened, he started, and uh, ran the Henry Jones Hotel down in Hobart and he shared a line with his staff every week at the staff meeting which was guys just a reminder we offer black tie service with a blue jean attitude and um it was what that was the brand you know it was like that's what we do don't forget it don't complicate it that's us and, and you're doing the same thing. Jamie and mate, talk to me. We've got to wrap it up, but I just want to talk um, a little bit more about the marketing. You do some great marketing. You've nailed expos. You do lots of them. I think the one thing that I haven't talked about on this show for a long time, if ever, is partnerships. And you've got some incredible partnerships. Australia Post, All Phones, Dick Smith, NRMA, NRMA RACV, et cetera, et cetera. These are big brands in Australia, guys. And clearly what a partnership strategy does is give you extraordinary Extraordinary leverage. Um, all of a sudden, you know, your brand is in uh, is, is is national. Um, wow, it's it's an episode in itself. Um, what's the trick to establishing a good partnership? Yeah, and sorry, Chris, again, RACV is not on our, on our list. Although, I'd, although I'd like, sorry, mate, sorry, mate. You know, like I'll do my homework next if time. If anybody's if anybody's listening, then from RACV, <laughs> come 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 on board. Happy to have you on board. Everyone else, all the other motoring groups are on. The look. The, the, the number one thing here is to be true to your partners. They are your customers. So be true to your partners. Now, some fundamentals we did in telco, a lot of the big telcos who had these partners out there were, were offering sharper deals if the customer come direct than going back to their partner. So let's think about this for a second. This retail store owner, this franchisee, if you like, would go and invest in a store Train, st- train their staff up, take all the risk. They'd buy some product in, they'd do the training. A customer comes to the door, they'd work hard and make the sale. And, and, and rather than uh, giving all the credit for, for then, on, then on forever to, to that retail partner, the telco would come along and um, say, oh, by the way, when you re-sign next year, we'll give you a sharper deal than the store can. And I, I just think that's disgusting. I knew that inherently from the telco business and I, I just think that um, – I just thought it was just absolutely disgusting. So, you know, we are true to our partners. It still is to this day more expensive to buy a travel sim online um, uh, than what it is to go to one of our stores. So we have a, we have an amazing model for the for the, the model. Modern, uh, internet society team it's called offline online offline you might find out about us in store by getting a brochure when you visit your australia post or your dick smiths or your all phones or your, or your or your membership group you get a brochure you find out about it from an email you go online on the travel sim website and you research about it you might ring the call center and we will push you back to that store to make the sale we will look after our retail partner knowing full well that we make a lot less money out of that sale because we're paying commission and margin and whatnot so this is the number now if you have these fundamental philosophies in your business business models drive behavior our business model is look after our business partners because they're taking the risk they're out there buying stock in they're supporting us um, so that's the number one thing that we that we do differently i believe than a lot of mm. competitors out there we look after ourselves you've taken the long-term view well, that's right. Uh, the short-term view says, hang on, we make a, it's a much better dollar if we sell it on our website. The long-term view is look at the power that the uh, these partnerships bring bring our brand. You, you know, you, you had to get your first partnership and there'd be a whole lot of listeners out here thinking, well, you know, I'd love a relationship with a, with a national brand, uh, whether it be in Australia or America or Canada or wherever anyone's listening. Um, is there just one little kind of nugget you can give us, Jamie, and – about that that first approach, you're laughing, mate. Going, yeah. mate, you roll the sleeves up, knock on doors, aren't you? Well, look, you know, <laughs> I, I was I was scratching and up, scratching the coins together, literally, to get a plane ticket down to Sydney to go and present to our biggest retail partner. Let the yeah, l- right. listeners join the dots. The um, <laughs> and we and I'd get down there, and, and you get and you get there, and you'd be waiting around, and they'd say, "Oh no, we've cancelled today's meeting. Too busy." Oh. And so I'd sit around around uh, dialing up. <laughs> Yeah. thinking what uh, the hell am I going to do I've got yeah. you know I'll get back and then that happened a few times and then um it took 18 months of door knocking to to get this deal across the line and they finally rung me up and said we're going to present this to the board we think they're interesting interested I don't think it's going to work for you though this is the uh, this is the the buyer uh, I don't think it's going to work though 
give me a one-page proposal, a PowerPoint, PowerPoint proposal. <laughs> so we gave them the one-page PowerPoint proposal. And you sort of stuck there. Do you, do you try and fit one million words on this yeah, one page yeah. or just the three <laughs> and try. hope like that? Is, yeah. So and the other funny thing is, Tim, um, we, we got this deal across the line. I got a phone call after the meeting saying, oh, I, I can't really believe this. They've accepted your deal. We, we want you in our store. Oh, wow, that's um, that's good news. And uh, I, I won't take the missus out for um, dinner just yet. Uh, we get our first order. And um, I've still got the invoice laminated on my wall at home. Um, you know, it was $76,000 and I thought, we've made it, love. Come on yeah. down to the restaurant and yeah. order whatever you want, darling. <laughs> I haven't gone through tonight. Go the surf and turf. <laughs> Might have been the surf and turf. And um, they didn't sell a SIM card for six months because it's that really, that's pre-season. That's before you've even run onto the field. So are they tapping you on the shoulder going, uh, Jamie, and you know that $76,000 order, it's not moving. You bet your bottom dollar they were, yeah, Tim. So yeah. then we had to get out and do the hard yards. So look, no, if you've got a good product and you believe in it, then by by all means, tap on these doors. But just keep in mind that brands like Australia Post, brands like the Allphones and um, the D- Dick Smith Electronics, they get knocked on the door every single day, hundreds if not thousands of times a year. Um and and they and they see a lot of crap, and their first instinct is to think, "Here's some more crap." Mm. So don't you know? I wouldn't base your future on it. If you, if you can convince um, end user customers, if you can convince end user customers to use your product in your own right, that's the best thing you can do for yourself. Because um, because these retail guys, they seem to think, "Well, hang on a second. We've invested our millions and billions. We've built our wonderful brand. We we work hard and it costs a lot of money, and we, and we get up and live and breathe our brand. And all you want to do, little little supplier, is come along and ride our coattails. You want to sell your soft teddy bear at fifty percent margin, um, you know, just because we've set up all these stores. Uh, you know, don't have that attitude. That they're, they're not your um, they're not your goal to a, a ticket of freedom in the Porsche. Um, make sure your product works. Get that right. Believe in it. Be passionate about. It, understand your market and where, how these guys mm. are going to sell it and why it fits with them. And then knock on the door. You know, we many many years ago, someone come to me and said, "Flight Centers wants to chat to you." Um, and they said, you've got one chance. You've got five minutes with a big guy and you've got one chance. And, and I said, we're not ready and knocked it back. And I've never actually got that chance again. Now, do I regret that? Do I regret not going and talking to the big boss of Flight Centre? To a certain degree, because I've heard he's a real hard mark and I wouldn't, yeah, mind, yeah. wouldn't mind sitting in front of him because he's, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's an amazing nice person. However, Screw Turner, his name is. Yeah, Screw Turner. However, um, had we have gone in there underdone, that sort of organisation. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you've done yourself a disfavour either way, haven't you? You've gone, well, I've missed an opportunity. Gee, I wouldn't mind that again. But gee, if I'd gone and actually done it, I would lo- would look potentially look like a fool and damage the brand in front of him anyway. And so, yeah, that's a hard one, isn't it? But um, good on you, mate. I mean, you're full of business courage, Jamie. That's what I love about you, mate. And you're straight to the point. You're on message, you know what you're trying to do, and uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. If I knew that listeners would tolerate a two-hour episode, (laughs) I'd keep going, but uh, I'd love to have you back one day and and continue the discussion. Look, I'd love to come back on. I I love what you're doing, Tim, with um, your information. It's brilliant. Um, uh, Entrepreneurs and and business owners like like me need services like yours, so good work on what you're doing, and it's good to be able to share some stories. I hope um, some of your listeners get even a little bit out of that because um, let's help each other out here and share the knowledge around and share our mistakes and what we've learnt. I know you wanted to talk about expos and um, a bit more about partnerships and so maybe sometime in the future I can make some time and come back on and chat to the expos. Yeah, mate, I'd love you to. Uh, look, I had partnerships, I had expos, I had website, you've got explainer videos happening. I mean, I've, <laughs> there is a number of questions still to be asked, but uh, that's okay. I might even get you to come into the Small Business Big Marketing Forum at some stage, mate, and share the love. But Jamie and Zimmerman, Travel Sim CEO, mate, I love your work. Thanks for sharing and being part of Small Business Big Marketing. Thanks very much for having me on. Good luck to everybody. Absolutely loved that interview. So many learnings from it. I hope you felt the same way. For me, here's my top three. Number one, the power of partnerships. Ask yourself the question, who can you do a joint venture with? Who could you develop a partnership that is going to give you leverage that you couldn't get if it was just you batting by yourself? Number two, the power of talking to your customers. The fact that Jamie and spoke to, what was he, took 5,000 calls from his bedroom in those early days. There's nothing more powerful than taking the time out to connect with your customers at a level of like, you know, just how's things going? What could we be doing better? And, uh, you know, it was just like even having the meetup yesterday with my listeners and just getting a sense of what they love about the show, what I could be doing better is um, is a very, very powerful thing. So the power of talking to your customers was number two. Number three, learning from that chat. 
I just love the fact that he chose an office close to a university in order to attract quality staff. <laughs> so I think that's really smart. And it kind of, there's a bigger thing there. It's kind of the question of, you know, what lateral solution, solutions can you look for in everyday problems that you experience in your business? And to think laterally, you know, you could easily just go, well, I just need an office that's uh, the right size and that has cheap rent. But Jamie has seen it as an employment strategy. I think that's really clever. So I love lateral solutions. If you want to go to the show notes for this episode of 152, uh, it's episode 152 of Small Business Big Marketing, I'll put a link into a past interview I did with Phil McKinney. Phil McKinney developed a process called Killer Innovations, and it helps you come up with lateral solutions to everyday problems. It was a wonderful interview, uh, and Phil's one of my kind of uh, heroes in the area of innovation and creative thinking, and uh, had the opportunity to talk with him about 18 months ago. So I'll put a link in the show notes to that. Uh, that is about it. Got lots of great interviews coming up over the coming weeks, so stay tuned. Look out for them. Head over to Facebook and join me there. You can see what's going on in the world of small business big marketing. It's at facebook.com forward slash small business big marketing. Join the forum. you got to join the forum. If you've got a marketing question, get into that forum. The Small Business Big Marketing Forum is populated with small business owners like you, and it doesn't take a lot of, well, it's very quick to join, very cheap to join, and it doesn't take a lot of time. You know, if you were allocating 15 to 30 minutes a week to just get into the forum, ask a marketing question, you are going to see improvement in the way you go about your marketing your business. I have no doubt. So head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, click on the forum button, and I'll see you inside there. That is it from me. I hope you got lots out of that episode. I certainly did. Until next week, may your marketing be the best marketing. See ya. You've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show with Tim Reid. Want more marketing goodness? Then visit smallbusinessbigmarketing.com.